Well, praise the Lord. Welcome once again to the Spirit of Truth. We are on the number nine lesson, the the golden altar in the Tabernacle Bible Studies. Again, before we get into it, I want to remind you that if you would like to receive the Bible study uh, in typology uh, in your church or Bible study group, all you got to do is give me a call, area code 865 201805 and we will see what the Lord had to say about it. Um, all right, let's get to this Bible study. Uh, we are here at the, uh, at the um, golden altar. So we saw in the cloud of glory uh, by day and the pillar of fire by night, we saw the, the type of the Holy Spirit and the type of Christ leading us. And then we saw in the gates that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father but by him. <clears throat> we saw in the Lamb, as John said, 129, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the true, holy, pure, perfect Lamb of God for sacrifice. And then we saw in the blood, Jesus said, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Then we saw in the labor that Jesus is our cleansing. And we receive this cleansing by a washing of water with the word. Uh, now we were, <clears throat> and then we went to the table of showbread, uh, which is Jesus is the bread of life. And now we are at the golden altar. So here we are, golden altar to burn incense. It was located in the Holy of Holies. And it speaks that Jesus, he ever lives to, to make intercession for us. See this in Hebrews 7, 25, Romans 8, 34. You know, uh, the highlight of the golden altar is, well, that's the visual illustration, the golden altar. The type of Christ is Jesus is our intercessor. And it, it, it's applied to us, the believer, Jesus is our advocate with the Father. We commit sin, we have an advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we can seek forgiveness through him. And then fourth, the believer's responsibility is we are to pray without ceasing. Now, uh, I want to say something about this uh, golden altar. When I was in Michigan about 15 years ago, we did a, we, there's a full-scale model of the tabernacle out there and uh, we did the Day of Atonement, which is the last lesson in this Bible study. And uh, we acted out everything, you know, the animals and everything. We didn't kill any animals. We just showed what they did. And uh, I specifically told to the people that were helping me, I told this one man, I said, whatever, whatever you do, make sure that you put the stage blood on the brazen altar in the outer court on the golden altar in the holy place and on the mercy seat upon the ark in the holy of holies. Whatever happens, make sure that you do that. And uh, there was a clear skies. And then uh, before we started to do the Day of Atonement, the clouds started to gather and it started raining. And it washed all the blood off of the stage blood off of the front altar in the outer court. And uh, so we waited till it stopped raining, then we put the blood on it again. And uh, he, uh, it rained again. And we waited, and then uh, a few minutes later, we put the blood back, the stage blood back on, and then it, it started raining a third time. I said, No, we're going to wait. We're going to wait this out. We're going to present this the way it was in the Word of God. And when it dried off, we put the stage blood on, on the outer altar in the uh, outer court. He went in and he put the, 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 the stage blood on the mercy seat. And I don't know what he, this man was thinking. He just bypassed the, the golden altar. He just walked right by it. So we started the uh, Day of Atonement. And when I got inside the holy place, I noticed that there was no stage blood on the golden altar. And I was, well, we couldn't stop the cameras or nothing like that. It was the news crew was out there. We couldn't stop anything. 
and um, we went on through it. I explained what it was. So when they developed the film and the pictures and everything, they brought them to me, and the guy was apologizing. He said, uh, you know, he, he, I said, well, it's over with. Don't even worry about it now. They got the message, okay? They got the visual. They got it. And when everything was developed and we showed it, I had never been so scared in all my life. We saw the stage blood on the outer court in the uh, altar of sacrifice. We put blood all over the altar. And we saw the stage blood on the mercy seat. But on the way back to the Holy of Holies, you could see that the, that the, um, the, the blood, there was blood on the golden altar, and that was not stage blood. I never seen anything like it. And, um, and when I saw it, I didn't know what to do. I just, like I said, it scared me. Because the message was, the second part of the message is, the church needs to be under the blood. The church needs to be sanctified. And I got rid of the pictures. I said, man, I don't know what this is. I really don't. Okay? So I just wanted to let you know uh, what happened out there in Plymouth, Mi Plymouth Michigan. And the tabernacle, uh, the full-scale model of the tabernacle is in a cemetery. It's in Memorial Gardens. Okay. Okay, let's get with this Bible study. The golden altar was... Um, to burn incense. That was its purpose, to burn incense. Now let me give you some physical characteristics because there's a message in that, okay? The golden altar was one and a half feet square, three feet high. It was made of shut -and wood overlaid with pure gold. The altar was 18 inches square. It had a horn at each corner. Uh, wood was overlaid with brass. It had a gold crown round about it, two rings under its crown by the two corner, corners thereof, upon the two sides for the two staves to bear it. The staves were made of shut -and wood overlaid with gold, and, and uh, the, these staves were slid inside the rings. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the size here. The size of the golden altar was three feet high, and... Uh, it was the highest piece of furniture in the holy place. And this speaks of uh, the Father raised Jesus from the dead and set him far above all. Jesus is head over all the church. And we really need to emphasize that in these last days. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and might and uh, uh, dominion. And every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. So Jesus is above all, above all angels, above all creatures, uh, high in, highest in the heaven. And anything that is to come, he is above that, the scripture says here. So Jesus is... If I can use the phrase, he's what's happening. It's him. When he speaks, we listen. Now, the material uh, of the golden altar, it was made of shut -and wood overlaid completely with pure gold. And if you remember, we said that pure gold speaks of uh, the divine nature of Jesus Christ. The wood speaks of his perfect humanity. Uh, now, there were rings, two rings, one in each corner of two uh, of the golden uh, altar. Um, they had uh, these two rings were gold. They were under the crown by the two corners for the staffs to bear it. They speak of the unending prayer that Christ has for us. The Bible says in Hebrews uh, chapter 7, verse 25, Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. Now, uh, these, if you remember, uh, the rings on the uh, altar of sacrifice in the outer court speak of uh, is the eternal redemption. Here at the golden altar, it speaks of unending prayer. Um, now, 
we need to keep this in mind. This is very important here because uh, prayer is set above all things. We'll see here in a minute. Um, so Christ is at the right hand of the Father, and it says he ever lives to make intercession for us. Now this applies to the believer's unending prayer. The Bible tells us that we are to pray without ceasing. We are to keep a praying spirit about us. Jesus said men ought always to pray, Luke 18, 1 and chapter 21 and verse 36. Now today we look around and we pray, we hear people pray, Lord, make me a big preacher, make me a big kind evangelist, make me this, make me that. But the disciples didn't pray for that, 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 that did, did they? What did the disciples say? They said, Lord, teach us to pray. I think one of the greatest examples in, in human time, I'm sure there's other greater ones than that, but let me tell you about Billy Graham. Uh, he, you know he's, a, he's been called um, the evangelist or preacher to the president, okay? Well, President Nixon had called uh, Billy Graham because he was concerned about, uh, he was concerned about the war, Okay? So he called Billy Graham, and uh, the secretary, Billy Graham's secretary, said, well, he's not able to come to the phone just now, but as soon as he's, he's free, he said, I will uh, have him call you, return the call. So an hour or so went by, and he had not called President Nixon, and Nixon got, got on the phone again. He said, I need to talk to Billy Graham. It's urgent. It's important. And she said, well, Mr. President, I, I'm doing what I can. I, I'll get him to you as soon as I can. And this went on for hours. And it was like something like seven or eight hours later. Uh, this shakes me up. This really does. Billy Graham called President Nixon, and he says, uh, he said, what can I do for you? He, he says, I've been trying to reach you for several, several hours. He says, I know it's none of my business, but why couldn't you return my call earlier? And Billy Graham said, listen to what this man said. He says, I was in prayer. And when I'm in prayer, nobody disturbs me. God comes before everything. Can you imagine that? Telling the most powerful man in the world, the President of the United States, to wait because you're talking to God. Wow, that is some heavy-duty stuff. Let me tell you, let me tell you, and uh, I often think about that. And here we can't get two or three minutes to get in prayer. How about that, huh? We don't even get in the closet, do we? Uh, so uh, the disciples said, Lord teaches to pray in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Now, large, it's important to understand that large or long prayers do not many times avail much. It's the simple prayer of faith that comes from a pure heart. The effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. I often tell a story about the little girl who church had let out and she ran out in the backyard as fast as she could. And when her mother and father and her, old, uh, her brother came out of the church, they said, where, where is the little, they wanted to know where the sister was. So the little brother went looking for her, and she was out behind back of church on her knees saying her ABCs. And the older brother looked down, and he said, what are you doing? She said, well, uh, I'm saying, I'm praying. I'm praying to the Lord. And he says, well, uh, well, you're not praying. You're saying your ABCs. And the little girl looked up at her older brother and said, yeah, Billy, but God knows what I want to say. He knows how to put the letters together. This is powerful stuff. It really is. You know, the altar had two staves of Shedham wood overlaid with pure gold, and they speak of movement and mobility. Wherever Jesus went, he prayed. He is our example of prayer. You know, we pray... We need to pray everywhere, lifting up. It's, uh, let me give you the scripture reference. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. We need to pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. 
Now, get rid of these stage plays in these churches. You give Jesus a hand clap. How about we praise him from the heart for real? That's where you know where the real people are. Praise him from the heart. Lift up our hands without uh, wrath and without doubting. Let's go back to the 50s and have church like we used to. And I'm talking about all churches. I don't care if you're Baptist, Pentecost, Methodist, what you are. Oh, we got a different Jesus in a lot of these churches now. And uh, now the staffs and the rings together speak of his continual prayer and intercession at the right hand of the Father in Acts 2.33. Jesus has a continual personal presence with us. In Matthew 28.20, Jesus said, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He's with us always. He's never going to leave us. And we can take a look at the horns uh, on the altar. And what are they saying? The altar had four horns on the top pointing outward uh, and upward towards the four corners of the earth. The horns on the brazen altar speak of the power in his blood. Remember, back out there in the holy, uh, in the outer court? Where the sacrifice was in the outer court on the horns of the altar of sacrifice, they speak of the power in the blood of Christ. The horns here on the golden altar speak of Jesus in his power in prayer. So Jesus demonstrated the power of prayer and intercession if we read John chapter 17, verses 1 through 26. Our Lord is at the right hand of God and has all power. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, and Hebrews 4, 16. I said that Jesus has all power. I was over at the mission the other day, and the place was pretty well packed. And I was teaching on the blood of Jesus. And here comes this guy. He wanted to give me some trouble. He was going to stop that meeting. And he bust open that door, and he come up there, and he started up to the to the pulpit. And uh, I said to that man, I said, let me tell you something, man. This word is going forward. Nobody's going to stop it. And when I said that, this man fell on his back. And, and, and uh, these uh, people started to come up there. I said, sit down. Don't even get up. You don't get up for Jesus, and you're going to get up for this devil? And the last word, when I said amen at the end, he got up. That demon got up and walked out the door. He, he said to me, well, why do you call that man a devil? Why do you say he's got an evil spirit? Well, why did he stop, try to stop the message, and why is he laying on his back? And these people that fall out on the back, you better think about that. The only time that anybody fell backwards on their back in the, in, in the New Testament is when Jesus or one of the disciples cast a demon out of him. Well, I'm sure the demon is still in that man because he got up quickly and he ran out, right out of place. Now, back to the message. There is power and strength in the intercession of Jesus to bring us into the fullness of God. This is the strength of us, the believer. We have power in his blood. We have power in prayer. We have a perfect refuge in prayer, and we need to drive that home to ourselves. The golden altar applied to the believer is the place where we live in the expectation of God's power and answered prayer. And this is another problem that we have in the church. When we pray, we've got to live in the expectation of the power of God. We've got, to, we've got to know it, have faith, and believe it, and expect it. Now, uh, the priest burned, Aaron and his sons burned sweet incense on the altar twice daily. Every morning, uh, as an act of worship to the Lord, the morning incense was offered the third hour, that's 9 a.m., and the evening incense was offered at the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m. Incense was burned at the same time. The oil in a candlestick was replenished, and the daily burnt, uh, yeah, burnt offering was made. Can you imagine what would happen if these churches 
who believe in who say they believe in unity, and if they really did in all of the churches, all the Christian churches throughout the nation, would all pray at the same time at uh, at 9 a.m. and at 3 p.m. I'm talking about for the, the the prayer warriors, the ones that are for real. Can you imagine what God would do in this country? That's a dream, isn't it? It is. It is a dream. You know, in 1 Timothy 2, 8, and John chapter 4, verse 21 and 23, we need a continuing praying spirit about us. To pray always, the Bible says, pray always with all prayer, all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. This is what the Bible says. E Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Colossians 6, 2. Continuing instant in prayer, Romans 12, 12. Our access into the, uh, uh, the holy presence of God is always, it always opens through prayer. Think about that. We are to pray always. Now, Jesus lifted, he lived a life of sacrifice and praise to his Father. It's all, it also applies to us in Hebrews 13, 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of, of, of praise to all continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. You know, I was in this Bible store before it shut down over there on Clinton Highway, and um, this, this lady was waiting on this guy, and he had, he had a bunch of stuff on the counter. And, uh, <laughs> and right in the middle, as she was ringing this guy up, the phone rang. So she answered the phone, and she's talking, talking, talking on this phone. This guy's getting, you know, he's impatient. He said, told the lady I have to go to work. She said, well, I got a phone call. And he says, uh, well, you should take care of the me. I was here first. And uh, she got mad. I mean, she started giving that guy down the road. And, I, and, she, and uh, the guy walked out uh, of, of the Bible store. And then she, she got through with a phone call. She came over to me, and she says, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I'm, this is all I want. Uh, and, and she, the phone rang again. She started over to the phone. I said, if you pick that phone up, you can forget it. I mean, if you can pick that phone up, you can put that person on hold. And she said, well, sure, sir, I have to. I said, shut up. And I walked out. I mean, she started with an attitude, and she's in the wrong. <laughs> That's the way people are today. You know, and she had something to say to, the, to another employee while I was walking out. I mean, listen, well, I'm, I'm getting off the stuff. Let me get back here. The Bible tells us that to burn incense uh, means to pray. To burn incense means to pray. The incense is a type of the true prayers of believers through Christ. In Psalms 141, 2, it says, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this pure, sweet incense of, of sweet spices. It was, it was a compound of four ingredients. Uh, this, this man over here is looking at me, wanting to know why I said that about that employee in that Bible store. The reason why I said that was, if she had a praying spirit, she'd have kept her mouth shut and done what's right. Okay. <coughs> The pure sweet incense of sweet spices was composed of four ingredients. And you can read of these in Exodus chapter 30, verses 34 through 38. They were stacti, anche, galbanum, and, and frankincense. These were the four ingredients in the sweet spices. See, the, 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 the stacti speaks of the life of Jesus. The Hanshe speaks of his death. The Galbanum speaks of his resurrection. And the Frankincense speaks of his ascension. Okay. Now, these, the ingredients that made up the incense speak of the Holy Spirit of God upon Jesus, typify the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Christ. Now, notice that his death gives us uh, salvation. 
That's how we're saved. He died for us. He shed his blood, right? The resurrection gives us uh, uh, eternal life. Because if he didn't resurrect, our faith is in vain. And then the ascension gives us the power to live for him because he sent back the Holy Spirit. I know I'm going fast here, but I'm running. Man, I'm out of, almost out of time right now. Now, <laughs> Jesus, I got to get this across to you here. Jesus is the perfume of God. All worship must be through Jesus who has passed into the holiness, having eternal, having obtained eternal redemption for us. That is Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Now, we saw the uh, ingredients that apply to Christ, the sweet incense of sweet sp spices. That's the perfume of God from Christ. Now, the perfume of the believer is prayer, praise, and worship in the Spirit with the freedom of the Spirit. Now, prayer, that is to pray without ceasing, to maintain a spirit of prayer. Praise and worship first by living the life of Christ in the Spirit, that's by being influenced, led, and directed by the Holy Spirit with the freedom of the Spirit. In the pure truth of God's Word, that's the freedom of the Spirit, the pure, pure truth of God's Word. Now, I was raised in a, in a Pentecostal church, <coughs> and uh, they're trying to tell me something different. See, 2 Corinthians 3.17, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. Freedom to do what? Roll on the floor, speak in tongues, lay back, act like you're slain in the Spirit. Is that what that means? Of course it doesn't. Now the Spirit, now the, the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. W meaning, where the truth is preached, the Holy Spirit will convict the hearts of men, and souls will be saved. Grace will abound. This is how we perfume God's sanctuary, God's tabernacle. That's how we do it. It's exactly how we do it. Now, uh, and people need to get into God's Word, okay? Now, um, uh, I'm out of time. I didn't even get halfway through this message. Well, anyway, it's a highlighted message. And if you're interested in the tabernacle, uh, you give me a call, area code 865-218-05. We'll get the chart. The Bible study to you, or better yet, uh, we can come out there and do a tabernacle tour, and we can explain types, and you can take it from there, or we can teach a 13-week Bible study. <coughs> if you need it, give me a call. If you need uh, the Spirit of Truth, bring the, the, the Bible study to you wherever you're at. Give me a call, area code 865-200-1805. Praise the Lord, and Lord willing, we'll see you next week at the same time.